Hi everyone, and welcome to Liberty Me U. Tonight we're here uh, for the first in of hopefully many uh, Future of Freedom Foundation webinars here on Liberty Me. Uh, tonight is the 100th anniversary of the Great State Crime with Sheldon Richmond. Uh, Sheldon is the Vice President of the Future of Freedom Foundation and the editor of their monthly journal, Future of Freedom. He's the former editor of The Freeman, uh, Fee's publication. And he's written on foreign policy, uh, international trade, the environment, war, history, just about everything. And certainly every time I read him, I, I learn something new. And I highly recommend his two previous talks that he's done here at Liberty Me U on the American founding. You can find those videos on YouTube or in the past classes page. But without further ado, I'll give it over to Sheldon. Matt, uh, nice to, uh, to be back on uh, Liberty Me in the, cl in the classroom here. And I, ho I hope it is the first of many uh, uh, under the auspices of Liberty Me through uh, NFFF. Uh, We've, we've switched here. We used to do uh, a monthly webinar uh, independent of, uh, of Liberty Me just uh, through uh, go to meeting. And uh, so this is our new format, and we hope it's a big success. <clears throat> so uh, tonight, as you know, I'm going to be talking about World War I, which, of course, uh, wasn't called World War I until World War II came along. It was known as the Great War. Uh, a great, I assume, in the, in the sense of uh, big, not in any other sense. Uh, first, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to try to do any kind of detailed history. This is really not going to be that much of a history lesson. There'll be history in it. But uh, that would be a very long story. There's a lot of details, and there's a lot of controversy. Uh, people are going to be arguing who is really responsible for this war uh, for a very long time to come. And uh, there, there, are, uh, uh, there are waves and uh, ebbs and flows of t interpretations. Uh, some people want to blame Germany entirely, and then and then uh, there's a phase in which uh, people rethink that, and there's some revisionism, and then it swings back, and so that's that's a whole story in itself, which I'm not going to cover. I mean, I'm not an expert on those those details. I want to, well, I said like I said, there'll be some history involved. I I want to kind of engage in in some musing and, and what what uh, what does it actually mean that this r ridiculous war uh, happened. So last month on uh, August 4th, I believe, uh, we hit the 100th anniversary of the start of the, <clears throat> the First World War, the Great War, uh, the four-year bloody nightmare that claimed 16 million lives, 7 million of them non-combatants, and wounded over 20 million people. It's pretty astounding when you think about it. <clears throat> now, that would have been bad enough, but the conflict was merely Act One in a much a bigger war, the, the so-called peace settlement, vindictively branded Germany uniquely culpable, uniquely now, and imposed border adjustments and reparations that made Act II a virtual certainty. The so-called Second World War, which began after the 21-year intermission from 1918 to 1939, claimed at least uh, 60 million lives, at, uh, and at least 19 million of them were non-combatants. <clears throat> now, Act II culminated in Harry, uh, President Harry Truman's two gratuitous atomic bombings of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the 69th anniversaries of which uh, we also observed uh, last month. <clears throat> as, of, as has often been pointed out, without World War I, and especially Woodrow Wilson's entry into it in uh, 1917, so we're, we're still uh, three years away from that anniversary, uh, there would have been no World War II, it seems safe to say, nor any other of the major consequences that inflicted so much death and mayhem on uh, the 20th century and beyond. Among them, the Bolshevik Revolution, which brought Lenin and then Stalin to power, Hitler's rise in Germany, the Holocaust, China's fall to communism and Mao Zedong, uh, and probably going to other things, uh, the Italy's, uh, the rise of the fascists in Italy. <clears throat> With so much having been written in the last century, about this war, what's what's really left to be said about it at this late date? Um, I think what gets overlooked is that the war is the clearest possible lesson about the omnipresent danger of government power. Uh, governments, by that I mean politicians and monarchs and, and ministers, etc. Governments uh, are a convenient uh, abstract term. We, we, we should never forget that these are individuals uh, plotting and planning and acting purposefully. 
they went to war, some perhaps more reluctantly uh, than others. I mean, people were doing this. They were making decisions. All shared responsibility for the carnage and devastation. Uh, could the men responsible for the war have wrought anything like the horrors they inflicted uh, on Europe had they not controlled a state apparatus, an army, a navy, compulsory revenue collection agency, a bureaucracy to conscript, that is to enslave the nations, their nation's uh, young males. Uh, the draft was fittingly called the blood tax. It wasn't just the European state system that, uh, that, that is implicated. Three years into the conflict, as I mentioned, a purported constitutionally limited republic, the United States, joined the orgy of violence and determined the tragic outcome. Uh, that the Great War brought to an end the haltering and perfect journey, journey toward genuine liberalism merely compounded the catastrophe. Uh, I don't want to overstate how, how uh, much liberalism had uh, come to, uh, uh, to prominence in the Western world, but it, it would be wrong to deny that uh, there, there wasn't real progress in that direction. Uh, there was a lot of world trade going on. There's, there's actually a marvelous uh, passage from... Uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes' uh, 1919 book, uh, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, where he talks about the war that came to an end in 1914. And it's, a, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a remarkable passage. He talks about how you could uh, uh, sit in your bed and, and pick up the phone and call and order products from anywhere in the world that would be delivered to your door uh, within a reasonably short uh, period of time. It almost sounds like you know today with the Internet, but he was talking about the telephone. He said he could travel without a passport. Uh, he, he, you know, just talked about uh, uh, with the progress that had been made, at least in the in Europe and the United States, and uh, that was shattered by this by this war. <clears throat> so who knows what progress would have continued on if that war had, you know, how it would, how it would have continued if the war had never happened. Uh, you know, we'll never know, of course. <clears throat> so to say. Uh, the obvious, this was no noble war, not by a long shot. It was a war driven by imperial rivalries. Germany was the relatively new player in the empire game. Uh, balance of power politics, the alliance system, which uh, hid obligations to go to war from people who would pay the uh, butcher's bill. Uh, petty, vainglorious rulers and nationalism, that pernicious invention of ambitious uh, uh, national leaders. <clears throat> Uh, as Ernst Gellner wrote in uh, his book, Nations and Nationalism, quote, it is nationalism which engenders nations, not the other way around. Uh, the Great War was a struggle for political aggrandizement, territory, domination, and economic advantage. Uh, as usual, states were, you know, more or less the executive committee of the ruling class, to use a... Uh, a Marxian phrase, but nevertheless, uh, one that has value. The politicians' solemn declarations to the contrary notwithstanding, this war had nothing to do with democracy, self-determination, or a wish to end war. Uh, war was that marvelous means to national greatness, masculinity, and forced collectivization. And they, they, knew, they knew it. Uh, it's interesting to also contemplate here that the, the collectivist pacifists, such as William James, like those features of war, they just didn't like the war. They did not like the killing, but they still liked the national greatness, the masculinity, and the and the forced collectivization, the collective unity. And they and therefore they hoped that a way could be found to to uh, to uh, have a what what James called the moral equivalent of war. In other words, you get all the good stuff and none of the bad stuff. The collectivism without the blood. Um, moreover, and most disturbingly, the war demonstrated how easily populations can be incited to, to eagerly shelve their normal lives, leave their homes and loved ones, and lunge for the throat of the other, or die trying. Uh, the left, by the way, was stunned that average people put nation before class. I mean, they, they, the radical left certainly thought that the, the working classes would, uh, would not participate in the war, realizing that the working classes across different boundary law, national boundaries had more in common than they had with their ruling classes. It didn't work out that way, though. People became nationalistic real fast. And this revelation that, that people put nation ahead of class 
is what drove Mussolini from the universalist totalitarian left, namely Marxism, to the nationalist totalitarian right, uh, namely fascism. He was a, an editor of a Marxist uh, uh, newspaper before World War I. Uh, dehumanization of the enemy plumbed the sickening depths, the idiotic willingness to take sadistic orders in the prosecution of the futile and lethal insanity of trench warfare hardly complemented a generation of young uh, European men. Imagine people being willing to do that for years. Uh, being in trenches in Europe, uh, on order, getting out of the trench, and maybe having your head blown off by a German machine gun or by a uh, mortar or some other, you know, some kind of ammunition. But nevertheless, being ordered to charge as if you, with your bayonet, as if your bayonet was going to get anywhere near your target when rifles and other forms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, armaments uh, could uh, t strike you down at uh, a long distance. And yet uh, they did it. I mean, I don't know what the, if there was much of a desertion rate, but uh, certainly the is not anything that is much talked about. Uh, but it wasn't just Europeans, of course. We've seen from America's experience in 1917 and beyond that this was not unique to Europeans. But in, what induces young people and elders to believe politicians who suggest that the noblest thing is to die for your country, <clears throat> meaning your government? Uh, in this connection, I always think of the words of uh, Paddy Chayefsky, uh, that, uh, that the words that he wrote for his protagonist, uh, Charlie Madison, played by James Garner in the great movie, The Americanization of Emily, uh, which was about World War II, by the way, but nevertheless highly relevant and uh, recommended. If you have not seen this movie, find it. You'll enjoy it. You'll watch it over and over again. I, I try to watch it every uh, Memorial Day, which is a holiday I've renamed uh, Revisionist History Day. Uh, so Madison is speaking to a woman the mother of uh, the, the woman he's interested in, the romantic, has a romantic interest in, uh, who the mother prefers to pretend that the war had not, that war, not just that war, but other wars, had not taken her husband and uh, son. Basically, the men in her, her life are all killed by war. And Madison's having uh, tea with her and, and says to her, and she's talking about how, uh, you know, there'll be books, when this war's over, there'll be books talking about how, you know, hellish war is. And at that point, uh, Garner says, or Madison, Charlie Madison says, I don't trust people who make bitter reflections about war, Mrs. Uh, Byram. It's always the generals with the bloodiest records who are the first to shout what a hell it is. And it's always the uh, widows who lead the Memorial Day parades. We shall never end wars, Mrs. Byram, by blaming it on ministers and generals who are warmongering imperialists or all the other banal bogeys. It's the rest of us who built statues to those generals and named boulevards after those ministers. The rest of us who make heroes of our dead and shrines of our battlefields. We wear our widow's weeds like nuns and, per and perpetuate war by exalting its sacrifices. Maybe ministers and generals blunder us into war, Mrs. Barham. The least the rest of us can do is to resist honoring the institution. I think of that speech every time I see, uh, you know, some program on TV or some... Uh, uh, honoring of the dead at the before a football game or a baseball game. Uh, I think uh, that that one uh, fragment there, which I've quoted many times, is is worth uh, committing to memory. We perpetuate war by exulting its sacrifices. I, in fact, I have a uh, bumper sticker on my car that says that. Uh, Madison goes on to say that that war brings out the best in people. Here's Chayefsky being a bit ironic. It brings out the best. Uh, in people in, during combat bravery, for example. Uh, Madison says it's cowardice that will save the world, though, because these uh, these uh, uh, virtues uh, are, the, are, are what uh, give us war and death. He says war isn't hell at all. It's man at his best, the highest morality he's capable of. It's not war that's insane, you see. It's the morality of it. It's not greed or ambition that makes war. It's goodness. Wars are always fought for the best of reasons, for liberation of uh, for liberation or manifest destiny, always against tyranny and in the interest of humanity. So far this in this war, we've managed to butcher some 10 million humans in the interest of humanity. Next uh, next war, it seems we'll have to destroy all of man in order to preserve his damn dignity. It's not war that's unnatural to us, it's virtue. As long as valor remains a virtue, we, ha we shall have soldiers. So I preach cowardice. 
through cowardice we shall all be saved. Great uh, moment in that movie. Now, another source of insight about war, the Great War in particular, is Paul Fussell, the late Paul Fussell, who dedicated himself to examining, uh, quote, some of the literary means by which the war has been remembered, conventionalized, and mythologized. Uh, close quote. War changes people and society. So Fussell looked closely at, quote, the way the dynamics and iconography of the Great War have proved crucial political, rhetorical, and artistic determinants on subsequent life. At the same time the war was relying on inherited myth, it was generating new myth, and that myth is part of the fiber of our lives. That's a book I recommend to you. Uh, it's called The Great War in Modern Memory. And then he wrote a second book about World War II called Wartime, Understanding uh, and Behavior in the Second World War. He's very interested in how war changed art, changed poetry, uh, changed uh, uh, fiction writing uh, and the culture in general. So very interesting stuff. I mean, war really deeply changes uh, culture. So in the Great War in Modern Memory, Fussell writes this, every war is ironic because every war is worse than expected. Every war constitutes an ir irony of situation because it's, its means are so melodramatically disproportionate to its presumed ends. In the Great War, 8 million people were destroyed. I don't know where he gets the number 8 in because higher, it's, it's certainly counted higher now. Eight million people were destroyed because two persons, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his consort, had been shot. The Great War was more ironic than any before or since. It was a hideous embarrassment that the prevailing meliorist myth, which had dominated the public consciousness for a century, it reversed the idea of progress, close quote. Fussell was fascinated by war capacity to cre create absurd juxtapositions. Uh, and he's, he's quite uh, graphic in, explain, in uh, describing this. One moment a British soldier sits uh, quietly uh, in the, uh, enjoying his tea and biscuits in a trench in France. In the next moment his skull is blown, blown off by a German shell and the human debris seriously injures his friend nearby. Fussell's virtue is in de demythologizing, quote, good wars showing that regardless of what patriotic poets and novelists may say, there is no glamour, no, ro no, no romance, no redemption in the whole bloody business. As he writes, what everyone knew, everyone knew what glory was and what honor meant. It was not until 11 years after the war that Hemingway would decla could declare in a farewell to arms that, quote, abstract words such as glory, honor, courage, or hallow, were obscene beside the concrete names of villages, the numbers of roads, the names of rivers, the numbers of regiments, and the dates. Close quote. I don't like when the Great War is described deterministically, as if it was inevitable. The war was not really caused by a, the Serbian plot in which the nationalist Gav, Gavrilo Princip assassinated Arch, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife uh, Sophie in Sarajevo, Bosnia which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but coveted by Serbia. The rulers of Austria-Hungary, Serbia, Russia, Germany, France, and the, the great, uh, great Britain did not have to do what they subsequently did, the ultimatums, the mobilizations, the honoring of uh, secret alliances. At every stage, fallible persons operating under perverse incentives, after all, they, they would not be the ones on the front lines, made choices, poor choices with respect to most people. Uh, war was never inevitable. It was the product of human agency. The, the world should keep this in mind as the politicians make choices today with respect to the mythologized Ukraine and the demonized uh, Russia. This time the great powers have nuclear weapons. Who can be confident uh, that, that uh, these similarly flawed leaders, quote unquote, uh, have learned anything from the great war? So I want to say something uh, take a few more minutes to talk about U.S. participation in the war. Now, as I noted, the, uh, that anniversary, that centenary doesn't occur for another three years. And I don't want to talk about what motivated uh, uh, Wilson. And uh, that, that's another whole long story, which uh, I don't regard myself as an expert in. I would recommend uh, Jim Powell's uh, book, Wilson's War, uh, both for its opening chapter, which talks about why um, how the Europeans ended up in war, all the secret uh, alliances and things of that nature, which mocked even the theory of democracy. These are supposedly democracies, certainly uh, England. Uh, and yet uh, 
the foreign minister was making secret uh, uh, treaties with France, which also then obligated the English to support the Russians, without the cabinet even knowing it, much less the whole uh, parliament, the House of Commons, or, and, and of course even further, much less than, than the people of England. All this done being done in secret. So it made a mockery of democracy. Uh, in the U.S., uh, of course, uh, as we know, the, uh, Wilson uh, got reelected in 1916 on the, uh, on the boast that he kept us out of war. So what happened in 1917? Well, what I want to talk about is what happened to civil liberties during the U.S. participation participation in the war, because that's an interesting story in itself. And I drawing on, I'm drawing here on David Kennedy's book, Over There, uh, The First World War in American Society, which is a 2004 book. And uh, I commend it to you, particularly in Chapter 1, The War for the American Mind. So, as I noted, Wilson was reelected in 1916, uh, having, you know, reminded the voters that he, quote, he kept us out of war. Because the war began in 1914, there were people that wanted to get in, but he, but he stood aside, although uh, secretly, of course, there were uh, things going on. And, uh, and so... Uh, there were certainly people that wanted to get the U.S. into the war on uh, England's side. There were close ties, of course, between the financial uh, systems of England and France, uh, England and the United States, and uh, and the U.S. had uh, had bought uh, had given loans to England that they were concerned would would not be uh, paid if uh, if England lost lost the war. So there was a lot of that going on. Uh, but as Kennedy tells it, most of the public. Even though uh, they reelected uh, Wilson, the public really didn't need to be dragged into the war, uh, kicking and screaming. They didn't seem to have a lot of reluctance. Uh, of course, they were upset by the Germany's resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare, and the, the people that wanted war could play on that. There was also the famous Zimmerman telegram, which was revealed where the, uh, the Kaiser had, or the Germans had contacted uh, uh, someone in the Mexican uh, government saying that if you join the war effort and we defeat the Americans, you can get back uh, what uh, America had taken from uh, from you guys, the Mexicans. Uh, I don't think anyone, I don't know that that was an actual threat, but it, it, it was used to stir up uh, public uh, animosity against the Germans. Uh, resistance did not, uh, American resistance, you know, most people, did not appear to be widespread. Uh, and efforts to suppress dissent and activities having nothing to do with dissent were more virulent at the grassroots level than, it, than in Washington. Uh, so generally, people uh, seemed to me were ready to go to war once uh, Wilson uh, said we were going. They didn't have to be convinced. At some point, American nativism kicked in with a vengeance, and the pro-war fever was easily exploited to turn up the heat on immigrants and workers. Uh, the propaganda campaign was remarkable, the rep repression more so, as though the policymakers feared that a little dissent could turn the whole country anti-war. Uh, Wilson said, woe be to the man or group of men that seeks to stand in our way. That was his warning to uh, war opponents two months after he asked an obliging Congress for a declaration of war on Germany. Uh, and Kennedy writes, they had no small idea as yet just how much woe was to be full then. That is the anti-war, the, the people who continue to be anti-war. Kennedy uh, believes that the suppression of dissent was made easier by a traditional American striving for agreement. The government's public school, known in the 19th century as the common school, won favor out of a desire to homogenize the religiously and ethnically diverse American population. The melting pot was a popular notion. And Kennedy says that those deep-running historical currents, darkly moving always beneath the surface of a society more created than given, more bonded by principles than by traditions, boiled once more to the surface in American life in the crisis of 1917-1918. Social stability was seen as requiring same, quote, sameness of opinion, commonality of mind. So dissent was not going to be much tolerated because that would have been broken the commonality of mind. So it was in preparation for war and during the war itself that the notion of 100% Americanism was forged. And most Americans were suspicious of anyone who seemed to be less than 100%. Kennedy notes that Wilson was well suited for the role he, he was assuming. He said, he writes, he had all, the, all his life been a moralizing evangelist who longed with a religious fervor to sway the public mind 
with the power of his person and his rhetoric. The war furnished him with a wider stage for the ultimate performance of the act he had long been perfecting. He subverted the more or less orderly processes of politics by stirring and heating the volatile cauldron of public opinion. Therein lay both his great political genius and a major source of his eventual downfall. Close quote. But Wilson's public reversal in the war caught many people by surprise, particularly the progressive intelligentsia, which, led by John Dewey and the New Republic, converted to war boosterism with relative ease. I mean, they were all anti-war until Wilson turned, and then they, they were all pro-war, and they all started fighting the, the good in it. Um, this, all, this was all to Randolph Bourne's horror. I recommend that you look up Randolph Bourne's essay, War is the Health of the State, or his larger essay that it comes from, uh, 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 which is known as, called The State. Uh, he did not live to finish it. He died in 1918 and didn't finish this essay. Uh, you can find it at anywar.com, but it's uh, on many sites. Uh, Bourne was one of the holdout uh, progressives who, who was essentially an anarchist, uh, at least as he got towards his last days, and uh, condemned Dewey and all those people who were earlier mentors of his for thinking they could steer the war uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cause of reform. He just thought that was silly, naive, ridiculous. He said... Uh, you know, it's like sitting on a wild elephant. You have no more control of it than you had when you were standing on the ground. So why, why, why you fool yourself into thinking you, you can uh, steer it and get good ends out of it? <clears throat> uh, Kennedy adds that some of those persons who, of sensitive conscious, conscience, would indeed find the passage from neutrality to war impossible to negotiate. Uh, that, that's born being one of them. The steadfast pacifists, like those who held to the original anti-war principles of the American Union against militarism, increasingly found themselves isolated in a wilderness of opposition from which nearly all of their countrymen had fled by the end of 1917. So if we think we're, we, we anti-war libertarians are lonely today, uh, maybe we hadn't seen anything because of uh, the condition the anti-war forces were back then, especially when, I, when you hear the, uh, about the repression I'm about to describe. Uh, just as the Eastern progressives hoped they could harness the unpleasantness of war to their reformist aims, uh, these were the Eastern progressives, the ones who were in the Midwest and beyond uh, actually were better on this. Conservatives and others also, uh, as uh, Kennedy writes, sought to invest American, America's role in the war with their preferred meaning and to turn the crisis to their particular advantage. So the right wing also saw that there'd be spillover benefits in their mind from the war. They could go after immigrants. They could go after workers who were interested in unions and uh, who might have called themselves socialists. So they exploited the war to go after those groups because they could add on to it that uh, you know, not only were they pro-war, but they were commies and they were foreigners. So it made it, uh, it, was a, you know, it was a great opportunity for people that wanted to, to uh, demonize uh, people uh, you know, in our midst. Uh, Washington's efforts to disseminate a particular view of the war democracy versus German authoritarianism, reached into the schools and local school officials obliged by stepping up the effort, for example, by outlawing the teaching of German. Uh, Kennedy quotes one Iowa politician saying, quote, 90% of all the men and women who teach the German language are traitors. That's pretty funny, isn't it? I think it's hard to read that with a straight face. By executive order, Wilson created the innocuous sounding uh, a Committee on Public Information, a propaganda mill headed by progressive muckraking journalist George Creel. Kennedy portrays Creel as a man who believed that the way of, Amer of shaping American opinion shunned coercion and censorship, but apparently not everyone agreed. Uh, I could go on uh, in more detail, but I don't want to. I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. Uh, this committee of, uh, of uh, 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 public on public information put out uh, pamphlets. Lots of pamphlets, thousands of pamphlets justifying the war, whipping up the support for the war, sending out a, 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 a brigade of speakers. Uh, the Justice Department worked with the American Protective League, which was an, a group of amateur sleuths and loyalty enforcers, to go out and snoop and look for people who are disloyal, who are anti-war. Uh, Attorney General uh, Thomas Gregory bragged, quote, I have today several hundred thousand private citizens, some individuals, most of them members of patriotic bodies engaged in assisting the heavily overworked 
federal authorities in keeping an eye on disloyal individuals and making reports on disloyal utterances. Kennedy says that by the end of the war, the APL had 250,000 members. That's, that's a lot of people. This is also the period where we get the Espionage Act and amendments known as the Sedition Act. Under the authority of the Espionage Act, the Postmaster General Albert Sidney Burleson banned publications from the mail or stripped them of their second-class mailing permits for even suggesting that Wall Street or the arms industry controlled the government. Criticizing the, uh, the government was regarded as aiding the enemy. Uh, so there was, there was this general uh, uh, atmosphere of if you say something against the war effort, you're a traitor, you're sabotaging the government's effort. Uh, as, we, as everybody knows, I think Eugene Debs was sentenced to 10 years in prison for making an anti-war speech. Uh, he, uh, he was pardoned, by the way, by, uh, by Warren Harding when the Republicans came in in 1920, uh, so he didn't have to serve. Uh, by the way, he ran for president in 1920 and got, uh, I don't know, a million or some votes from a jail cell, so that, uh, that says something. Uh, the, court, the, uh, the courts were no, no better. Uh, protecting civil liberties than anybody else. Uh, they constantly uh, upheld uh, rulings that, uh, that uh, punished people for, for speeches and, uh, and, uh, and other act peaceful, peaceful activities. Uh, the most notorious in, uh, in this uh, uh, realm was uh, uh, Justice uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who for some reason has had a reputation of being a great civil libertarian. One person who wasn't fooled by that was H, the great H.L. Mencken, who wrote a book review in 1930, which went through uh, Holmes's horrible record on civil liberties and, uh, and you know, bashed this reputation to bits, although I, I think it does survive. He's still considered a great progressive. Uh, let me see what I also want to say in, uh, in closing here before we open it up. Uh, I think we can, we can say that there's been some improvement. Today, people don't go to prison for making any war speeches. There's no draft, thank goodness, and nobody even talks about it. Once in a while, Charles Rangel, I think, brings it up. Uh, no one's going to jail for having a website that's anti-war, thank goodness. So there's been some uh, uh, definitely improvement there, we should acknowledge. I think the reason is uh, that um, uh, we could chalk this up to the devout respect for, pre for freedom of speech and freedom of press that is nurtured by hard-working organizations and civil libertarians uh, dedicated to protecting those freedoms. But, you know, I, I think it's remarkable that after 9-11, even though a, a lot, lots of bad things happened, the Patriot Act, and, and since then, you know, of course, the NSA spying and, and uh, torture and uh, uh, authorization for preventive detention, indefinite detention, uh, I think it is pretty remarkable that we did not see a crackdown on uh, speech and uh, and press. So I guess we can be grateful for, uh, for those things. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I hope I gave uh, people enough to talk about. I uh, hope I was provocative and uh, let's have a conversation. So I'll turn it back to Matt. Hi, everyone. If you'd like to ask a question, you can ask in text on the questions tab to the right. Or if you'd like to come on video and ask, you can click video chatting up above the chat window then click start your webcam and I can bring you on screen. Um, I guess I'll, I will ask uh, the first question. Uh, every time I talk to my father, he's a, he has a double masters in, in history about World War I, he simply repeats the, the tropes that we've all heard uh, about the, the real causes and the real villains of World War I. What book would you recommend as kind of a one-stop shop for debunking those myths? Well, I think it's, uh, if you want something really quick, like I say, Jim Powell's book, Wilson's War, which is mainly about Wilson getting into the war, has a good opening chapter on how the war, uh, you know, why the war got going. So he has details on the, uh, the various alliances that were being made. He goes back into the 19th century to show the roots. You know, France had... had uh, Lost the war to Germany, what, in 1870, lost territory, Alsace, Alsace and Lorraine, which Ger uh, France was eager to get back. Uh, so that's a very good one-chapter uh, summary, which, uh, which I have, you know, reason to believe is, is, is certainly uh, reasonably accurate, although, like I say, there are controversial uh, points about all this and, and tons of books. Uh, a single book, overall book on it, 
uh, I don't have one in mind. Uh, there, you know, there's a huge literature out there, uh, but I think if you uh, you Google around, you'll probably uh, come up with with something or ask a question on some libertarian site, and uh, someone will come up with a title that I'm that I either I don't know of or I'm not thinking of right now. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. I've linked to it in chat below. Uh, no questions so far. Come on, guys. There are 36 I, I, of you I, here. I, no I answered questions. everything, and so there's no... I've left no questions. That can't be. <laughs> uh, here's one from uh, Mike Reed. In the context of making the world safe for democracy, do you think that the change in forms of state governance that World War One ushered in is a significant effect of the war... Uh, in, I guess, in favor of liberty, peace, and prosperity? Uh, let me see. I think that the change in forms of state governance. Uh, I'm not sure I really understand the question, Mike. Um, can you elaborate a bit? Uh, you know, of course, it was said the the, uh, the war was going to make the world safe for democracy. This was uh, uh, Wilson's uh, declaration. Uh, the thing is, Wilson made a lot of declarations that the uh, the the European the the, uh, the Allied powers, mainly France and England, laughed at behind his back, maybe even in front of him. I don't think they respected Wilson very much. Uh, they're glad the U.S. got in. They needed to the help. The war the war, I think, in all probability, would have just uh, ended in a negotiated settlement if the U.S. had gotten in. Everybody was exhausted. There wasn't a lot of progress in the uh, trench warfare. Uh, and so, and that would have been a much better outcome because there would have been, uh, they would have gone to the some kind of, uh, you know, conference table as equal partners, all of them, equal parties, and, and Germany probably wouldn't have got, been able to get blamed under those circumstances because the Germany wouldn't have been defeated. It would have been just everybody saying, this is insanity, let's... Uh, stop this. Uh, Wilson brings in, of course, all the fresh troops and the, and the great wealth of the U.S. and all this energy and turns the tide. And so uh, the Allies are able to have a clear victory over over Germany and then really stick it to Germany at the, uh, at the peace conference. Uh, the French and the English disregarded uh, 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 Wilson. Wilson said this is, this is a war not for territorial gain. gain. That's certainly not what the British and the French had in mind. They had plenty of territorial gain in, gain in mind. They wanted Germany's uh, 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 you know, colony or two in, uh, in Africa, and they wanted to deprive, they wanted to take over the Middle East from the Ottoman Empire. This is something I've also written about. I mean, they cut a deal with the Arabs. They said, uh, if, if the British especially, uh, you revolt against your Ottoman overlords, and we'll give you independence in the Middle East. And they uh, they took the deal, and then they got screwed because the, 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 the England never intended to keep that promise, and they also had promised uh, a Jewish uh, homeland in uh, Palestine without ever consulting any of the the Arabs uh, living there, and the Arabs had no say in the matter, and uh, and so when they got the Paris Peace Conference, uh, you know the the, the Arabs uh, were double double crossed. Uh, so I don't know uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Let me see. Has he has Mike? Have you? Uh, Elaborate it anymore? I'm not yeah. sure. I'm, I'm, I'm he's, understanding. Uh, he's clarified here in the in the chat box. He said, meaning the increase in democracies and decline in monarchies. Sort of, uh, I guess, Hoppe has talked a lot about how yeah. World War One was really the death knell for monarchy. Uh, I guess some people took seriously the, that this was a war to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, of course, we could say, I think, as libertarians, that... Uh, it was a uh, people generally got fooled. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of democracy, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of monarchy. I'm not a fan of democracy either. But uh, I'm not a fan of, dem of uh, monarchy. I, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't share uh, Hoppe's view on that. But uh, if people thought if they get to vote for the leader rather than uh, you know they're being a hereditary leader that uh, they were going to gain uh, you know, substantial liberty not just in the sense of political liberty of going to be able to vote every few years. They really, uh, you know, didn't, they really didn't. I mean, the state, states changed their form, but they didn't really change the substance. I mean, as we know, states are coercive, and they do tend uh, to uh, to see to the uh, 
to the good of the uh, of the ruling elite and the well connected and what they do for the rest of the people are sort of bones thrown uh, to them to um uh maybe uh, uh cushion the blow from the special interest uh, uh legislation and measures being taken but then you know it doesn't really undo the entrenched uh, privilege there may be a new privileged group versus the old one under the monarchy but uh I don't think things substantially change. So whether it changed, whether it's, I guess the answer is uh, the war probably had a lot to do with this change in form, but but not uh, you know there was no real change in substance. I'd say. I hope that's uh, something like an answer. Absolutely. Uh, Jerry Ladd asks, how much of propaganda efforts changed since World War? I don't know that it's really changed that much. You you uh, you always want to uh, both you know I think in World War One and now you have to talk about the danger to the homeland. I don't know if they use the word homeland during World War One, but you have to stress that there's a danger. We can see this now going on with ISIS, uh, while you're getting contradictory uh, signals out of the administration and some of the people say we don't know of any, uh, we have no evidence that uh, there's a, there's now an imminent threat or a threat uh, from ISIS. But enough hints are dropped. I mean, I, Lindsey Graham, who, you know, is only a member of the Senate, not not, not not in the White House. But Lindsey Graham said the other day that, uh, you know, if this policy fails, or actually predicted that Obama's policy would fail, he said, when it fails, they'll come over here and kill millions of us. Uh, so, thirty, even at the most, thirty thousand ISIS guys are somehow going to get here and kill uh, millions of us. That's uh, I'm not sure that propaganda has changed very much since World War One. Our next question is from Bob. He asks, can you discuss the various propaganda programs that states use to encourage their population's support for the war? Sort of a follow-up to the last one. Well, they, you know, they, they distributed materials in schools to portray the war as a battle between democracy and uh, autocracy, dictatorship. Uh, that's that's how they did it, and they had, like I said, they had speakers going out, uh, sponsored by the uh, this committee on the public information, and also lots of local groups. Uh, there was there were uh, there was actually violence. There was vigilantism and uh, even some lynchings at the local level of people who were regarded as not being on board. You know, with the war effort maybe said something negative, and uh, and, this, and some of this was even countenanced by people in the in the. Uh, you know, in the law and the legal profession, for example, the the uh, former uh, attorney general under under Theodore Roosevelt, who, um, Charles Bonaparte, who, by the way, is a member of was a member of uh, the Napoleon Bonaparte family, it was a different branch of the family, the American branch of the family. Um, he more or less countenanced this local uh, vigilantism, including lynchings on the grounds that it's helping. Uh, it's helping the feds, the overworked feds. Uh, uh, but but uh, by and large, it was you know keeping subversive material out of the mails and uh, and going on the offensive uh, through speakers and uh, and pamphlets and getting to the the school kids. You know, uh, that's always that's that's why the, the public schools are always so uh, valuable to the state because they're great propaganda mills. Our next question is from Herman. Herman asks. What is the most notable consequence from World War One that paved the way for World War Two? Well, I guess the the very harsh uh, uh, consequences for Germany, uh, heavy reparations, which they, uh, you know, the, they had to turn to inflation, and they borrowed money from uh, the United States, you know, had trouble repaying, and then. Uh, the British had put on a, a starvation blockade during the war and kept it on for several months after the armistice was signed, uh, which I think was a, be, uh, a betrayal of a pledge to the to the Germans. They uh, they were told that if they would sign the armistice, in other words, they're calling it an armistice, not a you know not a surrender. Uh, th this was to make it more palatable to the Germans. But then once it was signed, uh, they were they weren't treated. It wasn't treated as if it was an armistice. They were treated as if they were just utterly defeated unconditionally and so there was a starvation blockade that was kept on uh, G germany britain was violating international law all over the all over the place was interfering with neutral shipping and carrying of goods that were not uh, you know contraband not uh, munitions 
And so you had a generation of German kids who grew up hungry. And uh, it's been often noted that uh, many of these uh, kids became the Hitler Youth. And then when they were old, old enough, uh, became the, the troops or the, or the Nazi army. So uh, I would have to say that was the, that was the big one. Uh, no, well, uh, I shouldn't say it was the big one. The Bolshevik Revolution was, was pretty big. Uh, Russia wanted to get out of the war. Uh, the troops were deserting under the czar. People were starving. It was really, uh, really bad. And, um, and then, so then you get the, you get the uh, first you get the February Revolution in 1917, before the Bolshevik Revolution, the first Russian Revolution, which then gives you a provisional government under uh, Kerensky, Alexander Kerensky. He's sort of like a prime minister. Uh, he wants to leave the war. Uh, he's prevailed on by Wilson to not leave the war. Uh, because, you know, the arms had been delivered to Russia for the war, and they, they just did not want the pressure taken off on the Eastern Front. And Kerensky stupidly stayed in the war, and that paved the way for the uh, November Revolution, where the Bolsheviks, which was a small faction, the Bolsheviks were not some big, powerful group, but it was the only party uh, promising land, peace, and bread. And, uh, and so they triumphed through, you know, a coup overthrowing Kerensky and taking control of the country. Uh, it took, they took Russia out of the war immediately, which was a, that was a good thing. And they also exposed the famous uh, secret treaty to carve up, uh, between British and France, to uh, Britain and France to carve up the Middle East. But of course, we ended up with uh, how many years of, 75 years or so of uh, communism, uh, which was not good for the Russian people or the, the people of uh, Eastern Europe. All right. Um, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll put out a call for more questions and let people know what's going on here uh, in the next week here at Liberty Me U. Uh, tomorrow night, we have a, uh, a cool show with uh, some a, a kid named Cal Moliné. Uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with him. Uh, he's got a small YouTube channel. We've decided to give him a monthly show on the third Wednesday of each month where he talks about anarchy. He's a great communicator, so come ask your questions about anarchy. Ask how you can better answer other people's questions about anarchy. It's going to be a great time. It's called Fight the Matrix, and that starts at 9 p.m. tomorrow night. And Thursday, we have two uh, sessions. The first is uh, the start of Jeffrey Tucker's class on uh, Ludwig von Mises. He's going to be doing a nine-part course, and the first session uh, is going to focus on the theory of money and credit and uh, Mises' early life. And then our second session on Thursday will be Virtue Ethics and Libertarianism with Roderick Long. That's uh, going to be a fun one. It's kind of a, a virtue ethics is kind of a, a third way between deontology and consequentialism that Roderick proposes as a method for arriving at the ideas of liberty. Sunday night, we've got Jeffrey Tucker continuing his Liberty Classics series, uh, talking about the use of knowledge in society by Hayek. And then Monday, we'll start a course with uh, G.P. Manish on the econ economic calculation problem. Tuesday night at 8 p.m., we've got Larry Reed uh, from FEE. He'll be talking about a student's essay that changed the world. And uh, we've got more questions here. Uh, Reagan asks, is war inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. Like I said in, uh, in my remarks, uh, it's always a matter of decisions being made by particular people. Uh, now, sometimes people may feel they don't have a choice in, uh, in what they're doing. And, uh, you know, in the build up to World War One, decisions were made to mobilize to, for, uh, and uh, that caused the other caused. You know what I mean? Uh, when I say caused, I don't mean it in any sort of uh, uh, mechanistic uh, way, but but uh, people make uh, counter moves to earlier moves, and they feel like they have no choice for whatever reason, honor, uh, or uh, they feel threatened. Uh, but they still are making a choice, and they could have done otherwise. So in that sense, I don't think anything in human affairs uh, is inevitable. All right. Uh, now, I've heard it claimed uh, that the outcome of World War I uh, significantly affected Asian politics and set Asia up for 
uh, what happened in there in World War II. Could you speak to that? Uh, let me see. Uh, I was just typing out a, a thank you for someone who uh, was thanking me. Uh, Asia. Well, I'm not an expert on, uh, on uh, sort of the Far East. Uh, to the extent that World War I sets up World War II, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I don't think that's a controversial point. Uh, World War II does end up uh, enabling Mao Zedong and the communists to take control of uh, China. Uh, J Japan, of course, uh, had uh, invaded China uh, as one of its uh, conquests during uh, World War II, and then, of course, Japan is defeated, and uh, there's there, there's chaos in uh, in uh, China, and there's opportunities then for the communists to take uh, Control from uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the, the nationalists who then flee to uh, Taiwan. Uh, so I, I, it seems reasonable to say that, uh, that that Mao's triumph in China, and he killed what 30 million people at least. I don't know what the latest estimates are, but certainly I don't think any any less than that. <clears throat> uh, he wouldn't have had that opportunity if World War II never had happened with Japan. Might might not have uh, you know been on its uh, its uh, empire uh, quest to build an empire. So you know, look, these uh, counterfactual history is is always dangerous and and, and risky. Uh, but uh, it seems to me the 20th century would have looked very different if uh, if that if World War One had not happened, or if there had been a more reasonable settlement at the end of it. Jeffrey Tucker asks, and similar to my or first question, but uh, a little different. Uh, World War One is so strangely confusing to people. What's the best single work that is short? Ah, well, yeah, that's kind of a uh, repeat of the question. Uh, I would recommend Jim Powell's book, as I already mentioned, and uh, I think the link is up there in the chat uh, section. Uh, uh, Wilson's War. Now, the main part of it, the main theme of the book is why Wilson went into the war and what happened, but he's got an opening chapter, which I think is a is a nice summary going back into the 19th century uh, to uh, describing, you know, what was going on that then led to this cataclysm. And, uh, so I would recommend that. Uh, offhand, I can't think of a single volume that's entirely on, uh, you know, the European war, uh, not the American side of it, uh, you know, for the most part, but uh, a book length treatment of why the war happened. There are such books, but I just I can't think of one at the moment. There's been a lot of revisions asks, over the years. Some of, how some of it going back to the to the twenties. But sorry, go ahead. Um how would the Bob war asks, how would the war have concluded without without the entry without of the them. US? I know you, you said during the talk it, you speculated it might have been kind of an exhausted draw. Could you speak more to that? Yeah, well I think and I think it's uh I think a lot of people take this view. I don't think I'm make, stating anything controversial. Certainly not. A, I'm not making a new point. Uh, the, the two, the, the, the Allies and the uh, Central Powers were exhausted after years, three, you know, three years uh, without a whole lot of progress. Uh, you had this trench warfare uh, in, uh, you know, France and Belgium with the two sides facing each other. Uh, dug, dug deep in and, and not making a lot of progress one way or the other. I mean, some would sometimes move, and then the other side would move. A lot of people were dying, uh, and uh, there was, you know, general exhaustion. Like I said, the Russians uh, wanted out, and uh, and so it seems to me if the U.S. hadn't gotten into it, it's, it seems hard to believe that the, the 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 leaders at that point, considering no one was making any progress, and all the death and the, all the money it was costing would have said, let's just all sit down, and they might have done something like what was done at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. In 1815, when they, they go to the Congress of Vienna, uh, the parties there, they didn't uniquely brand uh, France, you know, as this outcast and then impose these huge punishments on it, uh, which is, they did that to Germany. It seems to me they would have done that uh, if the U.S. hadn't gotten into it and given such a uh, boost of, uh, you know, energy to the uh, to the Allied powers, so that so there would have been uh, a much more, uh, you know, like I said, even-handed peace conference because it wouldn't have been uh, there wouldn't have been a defeat of any of the parties. Everybody would have gone defeated, and so you wouldn't have gotten 
uh, all the horrors that I discuss. Uh, and uh, it seems to me a very good chance you don't get Hitler the, uh, uh, or the or the uh, the Nazis or the Bolsheviks. Think of how different the 20th century would have been without without them. Absolutely. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker asks, I've said many times that central banking made it all possible. Do you think that's well, you know, I'm not a I'm not a banking expert. I I, I feel safe in saying it made it a lot, lot a heck of a lot easier. Uh, whether it made it possible, whether whether they would have found a way, uh, you know, I, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm in a, in a position to answer that question. Could they have raised the money in taxes? Could they have borrowed? Uh, you know, they fought past wars before the Fed. I mean, uh, there were there were some wars. So uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. There are definitely people who are better qualified to answer a question like that. Um, Jeff, I think you could probably sort of, answer it better than I can. <laughs> a sort of follow-up question for that. Are there any valuable books on the money behind the war? Uh, again, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Murray Rothbard has written uh, things about this, his, his work on the Fed cover, cover this period. Don't forget, the Fed opens its doors in uh, 19, uh, I believe 1915, I think the, the bill was signed uh, around Christmas of 1914. So we think of 1914 as the 100th anniversary, but I don't think it opens the doors up until the 50, 1915. So I would look at Rothbard's stuff on the on the Fed. He's got some papers as well as books uh, where he does talk about the war and the the, the importance the Fed pl uh, played in that. So that would be my, those would be my best recommendations. Excellent. Uh, Reagan asks. What was, in your opinion, the worst war of all time? <laughs> well, I guess in in terms of, you know, it's hard to rank these things. World War One certainly has to rank up there, given the consequences I've I've said. And and, and you know, World War Two was very, you know, was obviously horrible in many many ways, but it wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without World War One. So maybe that makes World War One. Worse, or you could go back to what I was saying in the very beginning that it was really one war with a, a you know a twenty what did I say twenty one year intermission between Act One and Act Two. Uh, I mean, look, World War Two took I guess the most lives, huge number of lives, and, uh, and a lot of non-combatants. So you know it depends on exactly what dimension you want to judge it on consequences uh, afterwards or death and destruction. You know, during the years of the war, there there are a couple of different criteria you could use. So I don't think there's one definitive answer to that. I think the lesson is absolutely stay out of war. I I think that's a a good lesson that probably all of us here can agree with. Well, thank you, Sheldon. This has been a great talk, fabulously informative as usual. Uh, if anybody's interested in learning more about the Future of Freedom Foundation, you can find them at, I believe, fff.org. And you can read uh, the monthly journal that Sheldon edits there. And we'll be back uh, next month with another FFF webinar. Uh, I don't think we've decided on a topic yet, but I'm excited already. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you, Matt. Have a great night, everyone. Take care.